Okay, so today we are talking about population biology, and this is going to be kind of a unique talk today. It's a little weird. Like, uh, normally we just talk about biology in here, but today biology is going to cross over uh, with sociology, with psychology, with like some other sciences in some really interesting ways, because we're not just going to talk about populations of organisms out in nature, we're also going to talk a little bit about human populations. So this whole unit is a little bit more about how humans play a role in the environment and how we interact with the environment. So we're going to kind of put the human piece into all this. So let's dive into population biology here with a little bit of review. Remember what a population is. All it is is a group of organisms that are all the same species that live in a specific area. So when we say populations, it could be a population of penguins in Antarctica, right? It could be a population of giraffes. It could be a population of humans someplace but it's a population of the same type of organism all in a certain area. So population biology. One of the things that population biologists, um, and biologists in general, make a lot of use of is something called a range map. And you might see a question about this on the test. What a range map is, is it's a map that shows us where a population lives, like where it exists in nature. And they can be really useful because they can show us, especially if we do them over time, like how a, how a population has moved or migrated through a certain area. Now, this is a plant right down here. This is called hydrilla. And uh, it actually is a water plant that is not native to the United States. So it was actually brought over, I think, from Asia uh, for use in aquariums. And it escaped into the wild. Does anybody want to guess, just looking at this map, the very first place it probably escaped in the United States. What state do you think? Florida, Florida right? Florida is obvious. L look at this. Florida is bright red right here. So Florida is kind of a, an interesting state for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of those is because um, there are a lot of non-native species there that have kind of played havoc and wrecked the environment down there. Uh, there's everything from pythons to all sorts of weird um, endangered cats and things that exist in the wild down there in Florida that should not exist in the wild. And one of the reasons for that is because people let them go. Another reason for that is that sometimes Florida experiences hurricanes. And hurricanes do some tremendous damage to homes and things like that. What if you've got an aquarium of some possibly dangerous exotic pets and the hurricane just wrecks your house. It doesn't necessarily kill the pets, and they all suddenly go free into the Florida landscape. Um, that may be what happened with hydrilla. More than likely, since people used to purchase this for their aquariums, somebody got done with their aquarium and walked out to the estuary and just went dump, dumped it on in, right? Go free little fishies, go free whatever's in my aquarium. Not really thinking a lot about it. And this plant, which is tremendously invasive, started to clog up all the waterways in Florida. And now if you go down to Florida and look in some of the little bywater, backwater areas, this plant is growing everywhere. And it's really bad for the native species that live there. Like nothing eats it, it takes over, it crowds out all the native plants. Um, it's not good stuff and you can see how much it's spread. Uh, you can actually see that another release happened over in Texas, didn't it? Somebody released some in Texas. And in fact, way over here is a big jump here there were a couple of different releases that occurred over in California. Now this stuff actually might be banned now. So usually when we figure this out, we, we try to ban the sale of these things, but that doesn't st stop people from kind of acquiring it. I'll give you an example of around here. Has anybody, whoa, let's bag that up. There we go. Has anybody ever seen this stuff before growing in the lakes around here? This is called Eurasian milfoil. Uh, it's an invasive plant, kind of like the last one. <clears throat> we were just talking about. Uh, this stuff grows kind of along the edges of lakes in Indiana, Michigan, all throughout the Midwest. It's horribly invasive. You almost can't get rid of it. In fact, sometimes they will drain entire lakes to try and kill it off and then fill them back up again because it's so hard to get rid of. Has anybody ever walked along the shoreline of a lake and like been like, oh, look at all these, like, you probably wouldn't walk through that, would you? See, I love this stuff. I go down, I'll dive down underwater and like dig up a whole bunch of it put it all over myself and come up as the swamp thing and go chase my niece around while she screams. I love stuff like that. Yeah, I'll cover myself in mud and 
Eurasian milfoil and run around all over the place. It's pretty funny. But uh, anyway, this is stuff, if you, next time you're out canoeing or out in a lake, look down in the shallow water, I guarantee you'll see this stuff. It's everywhere. And it's an invasive plant. We have quite a few of them uh, in Indiana and throughout the U.S. Let's talk, wow, we're jumping along here. Growth rate, okay? Growth rates show us how fast a population is growing, okay? Take a look, I've got three different, three different sets of countries up here. And I just wanna say this, throughout this talk today, we're gonna to talk about a bunch of different countries. We're gonna compare them, we're gonna contrast them, we're gonna think about human populations in some of these countries. Um, I have got nothing against any of these countries. I've got, honestly, I've got friends from a lot of these countries. Um, I love traveling the world, I love experiencing different cultures, but there are honestly differences in the populations between different countries in kind of how they do things. There's differences politically. There's differences in uh, wealth. There's differences in resources. And, and those things are very important biologically. So we kind of want to talk about them a little bit. Let's look at population growth. We can figure out whether a population is growing really rapidly, whether it's slowing down, or whether it's even got a negative growth. Just based on how many people of different ages are living in the country. So take a look over here at uh, Guatemala, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia. What are there more of, young people or old people? Young people by a lot. Look at this, the zero to 14 range. There are loads and loads of those. Lots and lots of babies. How about older people? Not so much, right? So what that's showing you is that in those countries, there are lots and lots of new babies being born and people don't live very long. They don't live into an older age. They tend to die sooner. Okay, it's just a trend. Uh, let's look over at Spain, Austria, and Greece. They've got a zero growth graph. So looking at that, they have kind of about the same number of babies being born, young people living, right all the way on up through old age. And yes, it does taper off at the top, but that's not surprising because some people don't live forever, right? At some point, they, they don't survive. So the top of every graph is gonna pretty much taper off. So uh, there's, but going up, it's almost kind of vertical here. So they're not growing, their population's staying about stable. They're having about enough babies to replace the people that die. Then let's go to negative growth. Germany, Bulgaria, Italy. So they have less people being born down here at the bottom, it's like inverted, and there's more and more older people up here towards the top. And of course, it still does taper off at the very, very tippy top. So they have a more aging population. Now, don't worry about Germany and Bulgaria and Italy. They're not going to go extinct. They're totally fine, right? But they're not replacing their people faster um, than like some place like Guatemala, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia. Okay. So that's how you read one of these things. We're going to come back to this later on. But I want you to think about this for just a minute. You probably know a little bit about geography and about these countries. Think about differences that might exist in Guatemala, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, as compared with, say, Spain, Austria, Greece, America. Like, what kind of differences are there living in a country like that as compared to, say, Spain, Austria, or Greece? How many resources do you think are available? Do you think that there's clean drinking water easily available? Is there pretty much any amount of food that you might need to eat? right? Uh, is there, is there health care? Think about those situations. They're very different between these countries. Think about things like human rights, right? Do people in each of these countries experience the same amount of rights? Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind, because we're going to come back to it, okay? Because it's important for population growth. Okay, let's look at how populations uh, increase. And the first thing I want to talk about is something called exponential growth. And that is unchecked growth for a population that's living in ideal conditions. In other words, there's all the food available that they could ever want. There's all the water. There's all the space. That Eurasian milfoil I showed you a picture of, it's invasive. When it came in, it was basically unchecked growth. There was nothing eating it. It just took off. There was all the water it could want to be in. And it just spread like wildfire. So what we see in exponential growth is a graph that looks like a J. And you kind of have to think about it a little bit to see the J. It's the red line that starts down here, and it scoops up very fast. 
So a few babies lead to a whole bunch more babies, which lead to a whole bunch more babies. And population increases really, really rapidly. Okay. Let's compare that to linear growth. That's the blue line down there. A linear growth graph would be a very gradual type of growth. It would look like this. All right, I think you can answer one of your questions on your thing here, at least two of them. There's a question about J-shaped graphs. Cool. So the J-shape shows us this exponential curve. Now you've experienced this before. You have experienced this before, I guarantee you. Anybody recognize that? What's that little icon? Yeah, snap, Twitter, chat, face, fart, whatever it is, right? So think about when you first, anybody use Snapchat? How many people use Snapchat? Oh yeah, Snapchat or Facebook? Snapchat, okay. What about Snapchat or, or TikTok? Both at the same time? <laughs> you guys have more thumbs than me. Really, wow. Think about how, think about how, how the, this kind of came about. So when you first heard about Snapchat, it was probably from a friend, right? A friend was like, hey, check this out, or TikTok. A friend was like, hey, look at this really dumb video of this guy falling down. And you're like, ha ah, that's the funniest thing I ever saw. How do I get more of that? And you got one, right? And then you walk over to your next friend, you're like, hey, look at this funny of this other guy falling down. Look at this, it's really funny, right? And they go, ha ha ha, I wanna get some of that. And pretty soon everybody's looking at this funny video of this guy falling down. Right? And it just went up exponentially because each person told five more people and those five people told five more people each and it just went up and up and up and up and up. That's exponential growth. So this is not just a biological concept. If you're an investor in the stock market, you want to find something that's gonna exponentially grow. You want to pick it out way down here like where it says November 11th. You wanna pick it out right here and go, that's gonna be the next big exponential growth. You put in you know, $5,000 right here on November 11th, and you let it ride, and if this happens, if five people tell five people, which tell five people, like crazy, right? It's gonna zoom right up, pretty soon you're a millionaire. Like That's what people do who play the stock market. They try to pick these trends out like this and put a bunch of money on it, right? So reading graphs is, more important than, it's important for things other than just biology, right? So what about exponential growth? Can it just grow and grow and grow forever and ever and ever? Is there ever an end to it? Do you think people will ever stop using Snapchat and it'll stop growing that much? It'll just be really like, you guys are like, no way, Snapchat is the best thing ever, it's not gonna happen. No, it's already started to happen, right? Because people discovered the TikToks and now they're TikToking and Snapchat has slowed down a bit. Right? Uh, before this, it was iTunes. I could have put a graph, Did anybody use iTunes anymore? Probably a little bit, okay, a few people, yeah. So probably not so much, right? iTunes was like the thing, you could have bought in early like that and it just shot up at, like this. And then after some of these other music services started, like Spotify and things, it just kind of like flattened off. Maybe it didn't decline, but it flattened off. So things don't grow exponentially, usually, forever and ever and ever there is stuff that stops their growth. And we call those things limiting factors. So limiting factors provide a check. They slow the growth of a population. So let's talk about this squirrel up here. We were outside a couple of weeks back. We were down in the little patch forest down here. And I think some of you guys saw a squirrel. Some of you guys were chasing it around, I think. There are, there are some squirrels out there, right? And there's not an unlimited number of squirrels out there. There's a limit on it. And one of the things that limits that are these factors called limiting factors. What might limit the growth of a squirrel population? What kind of things? Any thoughts? The what? Their habitat. Their habitat, right? Like how big is the habitat? There's a limit on space. You can't put squirrels right next to each other across the whole thing and then on top of each other. There's obvious limits. How about nuts? There's only so many nuts, right? Squirrels gotta eat, so nuts are a limiting factor. My sister, my sister's got a dog named Eddie, and this dog loves squirrels. I mean, he loves them. If he, Eddie is outside and a squirrel enters my sister's yard, that squirrel is done for. He grabbed a squirrel one time and went back in the dog door and shook that thing until there was like 
a horror movie scene across her carpet, all over her walls, like everywhere. Like she can't let him outside anymore unless she's home because he'll bring a squirrel inside and then, you know, play with it a little bit, like a lot. So he definitely limits the squirrel population down there. Squirrels will limit the population themselves. Like because squirrels are territorial, they don't want a squirrel living too close to them. They'll fight it off. So there are many limits on how many squirrels can live. And we could actually run a calculation based on the area, based on how many nut trees there are out there, and come up with like how many squirrels it could support. Kind of like that Kaibab paper that we did. Okay, so there are limiting factors in nature. Let's look at two of the types of limiting factors. We can broadly group them into what's called density dependent limiting factors and density independent limiting factors. Now I just put dependent ones up here because the independent ones are really pretty easy. Almost all factors that affect a population depend on density. And by that I mean how big the population is. So if you think about things like the food supply, well the food supply depends on how big the population is. So it's called a density dependent factor. Okay. Um, if you think about things like disease, disease is a density dependent factor. The bigger your population is, the more rapidly a disease spreads. And we saw that firsthand with the coronavirus, right? You look at any of the larger cities that were afflicted by it, and the disease spread incredibly rapidly because people are really close together. Anytime you have a large population of whatever it is, diseases tend to crop up and spread really, really fast. Um, but just about anything you can think of, like food supply, resources, all of that's dependent on density of the population. The only thing that would really be a density independent thing would be the weather. Because it doesn't matter how many moose you have, if there is a giant tornado or a forest fire or a meteorite strikes or something like that, they all get affected. It doesn't matter if there's 10 or, or 10,000, they're all getting hit. Okay, so really the weather is the only density independent one. But let's look at this graph. This is Isle Royale, um, and this is a famous study that took place. I think they radio collared every wolf on the island, every single one, and they kept very close track. I don't know if they tagged them or what they did with the moose, but they kept very close track of how many moose there were. Since it was an island, they could literally count every single last moose and every single last wolf. And they did this over a number of years to track it. And as you follow and start out here, the wolves are in blue on the graph and the moose is in red. And we kind of start out in the populations, there's, there's more wolves than there are moose. Okay. There weren't very many to start with here. And as we go along, like in comparison, comparison wise, because we start out here and there's the red here is the moose, we're at like about a little over 400 moose and the wolves are, there's about 20 wolves, okay. So as we start out here, the wolf population starts to decline a little bit. And as the wolves decline, the moose population increases. Surprising? No, right? Because what do wolves eat? Moose. So less predators means more of the prey grow and more of them reproduce and you have more moose. So as we go here, we can watch what occurs. The moose population starts to go up and this often happens in nature, is their predators then start to increase. So just behind the increase of the moose population is the increase of the predators. Well, the predators continue to increase, the wolves increase. What's happening to the, to the moose when the wolves increase? Moose go down, because wolf got to eat, right? Well, then something occurs up here in the wolves. Their, their population is like at an all-time high. There's 50 wolves living on this small island. There's a CPV break outbreak. That's a disease that affects dogs and wolves and the population just tanks. Remember we talked about carrying capacity? I don't know what it is for wolves here, but I guarantee you that little dot right there for CPV is above carrying capacity. Disease outbreak, plummet. Falls way below carrying capacity. And after that occurs, the moose start to come back. And the moose come back kind of a little too much, don't they? And they most certainly overshoot their carrying capacity. Now, it's, this isn't labeled up here on the graph, but what happens is there was 
um, a couple of harsh winters, so it got very cold. It was hard to find food, and the moose population was huge. 2,400 moose. There was not enough food. Starvation, death ensues, and the moose population tanks again. And it just kind of comes back up. So there's like this interplay in nature, and you can follow it, where as one goes up, the other starts to go up. As one goes down, the other one kind of comes down. And they kind of play back and forth like that. But these are density-dependent limiting factors. Okay. I think we answered the question there, didn't we? Yeah. So think about, say, fish. Density-dependent limiting factor for fish. Well, there's, there's all the water they could possibly need, right? They live in the water. So that's not really going to affect them, is it? So think about things that might affect the fish. Okay. All right. I think I just answered the next question anyway. But let's talk carrying capacity. So you could kind of think of carrying capacity, which we talked about in the Kaibab, a little bit like a big barrel. And there's constantly being new, new babies are being born into this barrel. But the barrel can only hold so much. That's the carrying capacity, like the top level of this barrel. barrel. And so water or organisms are spilling out and deceasing because of starvation, accidents, pollution, old age, disease, predation, right? All of those limiting factors we talked about keep that barrel topped up right at the carrying capacity. So how do we kind of equate that mathematically? Well, we're at carrying capacity in a population when the amount being born equals exactly the amount that are dying. You're right at the carrying capacity of the land. Okay. What if birth rate uh, is increasing faster than death rate? You're way over carrying capacity, right? Probably can expect some bad things to happen. Because anytime we overshoot carrying capacity, uh, there's usually a big die off in nature. Everybody have that one? Let's look at a graph for that. It might make it a little bit easier. Here's that exponential growth. It's a J-shaped growth graph. The first part of it is here. It goes, this red line kind of shoots up like this, okay? Notice how it turns. It, what we say, we say it S's out. So you have to kind of interpret a little bit here. It's like a J here, but if you put the other arm on it, it's kind of sort of an S. They call it a J, an S-shaped growth. An S-shaped graph like this shows us that the population has been limited. Like we said, it's not going to grow forever and ever and ever. Eventually, it's going to turn the corner and hit carrying capacity. Now, in reality, the red line kind of shows you what happens in nature. In nature, it's never a perfect story. It never just kind of goes up and then flattens out. Populations overshoot, and then they drop. And usually what happens over time is they stabilize, is they just kind of fluctuate. They hover back and forth around that lot, the top of that line, the carrying capacity there the top of that blue line. Okay, so that's usually what it looks like in nature. And that's known as limited growth or logistic growth. So the growth has been limited. It was going up exponentially, and then it was limited. So everybody have that one? Let's type, let's talk reproduction patterns in life histories. Ooh. You know what those are, right? Do you guys get those in your houses this time of year? No, you don't, you don't get, nobody lives out in the country and gets those in their house? Oh my gosh, in the, in the fall, these things just swarm into my house. Oh, it's terrible. You get a vacuum cleaner out and just suck them up. They're really bad. These are, these are ladybugs or lady beetles. And uh, most of the ones you see around here are actually invasive, they're not native. Farmers brought them over to put in their fields because what do these eat, anybody know? They eat aphids, and aphids eat plants. So we brought these big mounds of these Asian lady beetles over. We do have native ones, but they don't quite look the same. Um, but so we have lots and lots of these now. But they're, different organisms have really different patterns in how they reproduce, in how they grow. And we can kind of group them into two big groups, the slow ones and the fast ones. So let's take a look here. Ones that have a slow life history have a really big body size typically, okay? They tend to mature very slowly. Think about the elephant in the picture. They reproduce later in life. They tend to live a longer lifespan. 
Do they have a lot of babies or very few? Typically, they have very few babies. They typically care for their young and stick around and take care of them. Okay, so think about that in terms of the elephant. What else would have a slow life history pattern? Well, just about any mammal is going to have a slow life. Even the ones that reproduce, as we would say, kind of fast, like when we think of rabbits, because they're reproducing like rabbits, they do tend to have a lot of offspring, but not in comparison to something like this. These things have very, very rapid life history patterns. So when you think of insects, for the most part, they don't stick around and hang out and take care of their babies. Right? They grow up really fast. They're very tiny for the most part. They mature quick. They reproduce really early on. For a mosquito, you know, it hatches out, and within moments of hatching, um, moments of um, becoming an adult, it's flying around and getting its first blood meal. And as soon as it drinks, it's going to go reproduce. And it's going to lay not one or two eggs, but hundreds of eggs. And within a few weeks, those things are going to be flying around doing the same exact thing again. It doesn't stick around and make sure the eggs are all okay and that, you know, little Sa Sally Mosquito grows up to be all that she can be and, and Susie Mosquito is doing okay over here and Bobby Mosquito is all right, right? They just take off. Maybe it flies away and dies. Maybe I smack it. Who knows? But they've got a very rapid life history. It doesn't, it's not worse or better. It's just different. And obviously it works or it wouldn't still be here, unfortunately, right? So those are the two life history patterns. Okay, we're gonna turn now to human populations. Okay, we answered that one. Cool. So think about this picture here. And I know this is, this is in England, uh, so it's not here. But do any of you live out in the country where, where your, your nearest neighbor is maybe a mile away? Anybody? Yeah, awesome. It's kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah, like, it, it's, it's very different than some of us that might live in the city. Like, your nearest neighbor might be, you know, 30 feet, 50 feet away. Like, the house is just right there. Or if you're in an apartment, it's right there, literally, on top of you or underneath of you. So, how humans live and, like, what our populations look like can be really different, even in the same country, which is one of the things, I think, that makes America such a unique and confusing place is because we have really dense population centers and we have areas that are not so dense. And so oftentimes I think that affects everything from our politics to our life history to just about everything, right? Um, but it's important to recognize. And I wanna look at kind of human populations broadly and sort of how things affect us. Consider this right here, this right here, this picture, in comparison, even those of you guys that live in the city, comparison to a city that might look more like this. Whoa. For me, living out in the country where I live, or spending most of my life out in the wilderness, uh, this is terrifying. Like, I don't want to be someplace where there's that many people. Like, malls scare me to death. I hate the mall. It's my, my least favorite place in the world to go. Do malls even exist anymore? Malls. Yeah, malls. They are, they're around still. I haven't been in one in ages. Like, I, I just can't deal with it. I can't deal with being around all those people trying to buy things at the same time. It drives me crazy. Amazon was the best thing that ever happened to me. I can just click on something. I don't have to talk to anybody. don't have to worry about it. It comes in the mail. It's all good. But the population's really different, right? Think about the differences that these people live with every day as compared to the differences that the other people live with in the last picture. It's not better or worse, but it is very different, isn't it? Has anybody been to, say, New York City or, or deep into Chicago? Yeah, it's totally, totally different, isn't it? Like, way different than here. I was in, in New York one time, I was walking around, I was like, my neck hurts, I just couldn't stop looking up. And you're like, way up at the top, there's these tiny little windows. Like, somebody lives up there. How do they get their groceries in there? What do they do if they, like, want to bring some large object home? How does it, how does it even go up there? Right? It just, it just boggles my mind. But I've never lived someplace like that. Um, so... Let's look at demographics and kind of how that plays out. But I want you to keep in mind that as we talk, different parts of the world might look very different than anything you've ever seen before. Okay, and I know we usually think from our own perspective. So try and open your mind a little bit as we talk. Let's go through human population growth. We're gonna start with the Roman Empire. I know my screen is horribly pixelated, but the larger 
uh, white dots that are on this thing represent a million people. Every one of those dots is where there's a population of a million people. So going back to 1 AD, the Roman Empire, uh, we can see over here, this is China, and we've got India's got quite a few folks. Uh, Europe's got quite a bit going on. There is literally nothing in North America. Are the Native Americans there? Yes, but there's not a million of them in any one spot where we can put a dot. I know it looks like there's dots because my screen's out. Down south here, uh, down kind of in this region right here, down through Mexico, down in that direction, we run into the Aztecs and the Incas. So yeah, there are some big populations and a couple little spots down there. Australia, nothing, right? The Aborigines are there, but there's not a million of them in any one spot. Get it? So let's move forward and we're gonna make some big jumps. That was a humongous jump. We just jumped to 1800 AD, industrial age starts. We start building machines, we start burning coal, we start burning oil, we start making things that make our lives easier and better. And look at what happens over here in China, Japan, India, right? Look at parts of Africa are starting to blossom here. Uh, England, all of Europe, oh my goodness, right? South America is starting to hit here. A uh, Australia, New Zealand, still nothing, right? Uh, Papua New Guinea's got two dots on it, right? There's not much going on over there. It's a billion people in the world. Jump up from there, 1930 AD, two billion people. We enter the world wars and it doesn't even make a tiny dent in populations. We're up to two billion people. America is now colonizing. Notice how it almost looks like you can see where we first land, the Eastern seaboard, and we then start to spread kind of like an invasive species right across the continent, don't we? Almost looks like that hydrilla map in a way. So we start spreading through the Americas. Um, we can look over here, Australia now has a couple little dots. Does anybody know how Australia was peopled? Where did the people come from? The, 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 the um, European people come from that ended up in Australia. You learn this in history? Yeah, they came from England. Do you know why they came from England? They got kicked out, that's, it. that's a nice way of putting it. Um, England shipped all of their prisoners to Australia to get rid of them. So that's what they did with you. And it might have been as something as simple as like stealing a loaf of bread to feed your family. Uh, they put you on a boat and sent you to, they sent you down to Australia. And so that's, that's why people talk about um, criminals peopling Australia. They're, P Australians aren't criminals, right? They're fantastic people. But that is how it got peopled with uh, Europeans. Now the Aborigines were already there. Um, New Zealand's still got nothing going on down here. Jump forward here, that's two billion people. Look at all those dots. 3 billion people by 1960. That's modern medicine. So think about what modern medicine does to the human population. Suddenly for the first time, if you get a cut on your arm, there's something called antibiotics. And we don't solve it by cutting your arm off and amputating it. Doesn't that sound barbaric? Like you get a little cut on your arm, it starts to get infected, it gets all red and nasty, and you go into the physician or whoever does this sort of thing and they go, all right, bite down on the stick, we're cutting your arm off. That's barbaric, isn't it? Nowadays we have medicine, you just take a pill and you're all better. Think about that compared to what we're gonna be talking about in the future here with things like cancer. How do we treat cancer nowadays? It's utterly barbaric. Think about it. You're used to it because you hear about it all the time, but we hit people with radiation to kill it. We cut it out of them. We pump them full of chemicals to try and kill any little bits that we missed. That's how we deal with, with cancer now. I guarantee you, 100 years from now, maybe 50 years from now, we will look back at that just the same way as you look back at people cutting a leg off because they got a cut on it, they got infected. You know, it will be the same type of situation. We'll be like, that was so barbaric. How did they do that? Because we're already developing medicines where it, it's literally just a pill that you take and it cures your cancer. Like that is the forefront of all this CRISPR technology and genetic engineering and, and our understanding of biology. We, we, are, we are starting to develop things like a pill that will wipe out a cancer. Right? Things like vaccines, oh my goodness, right? The technology that goes into developing a vaccine whew, boggles your mind, right? So 
modern medicine is a big boost to the human race because people now live a whole lot longer. Three billion. 1975, modern medicine continues. We hit four billion. Watch how fast the numbers jump up. Look at how many dots there are there. Five billion. The numbers are jumping quicker. We're not jumping many, many years, are we? This is exponential increase. We're just going a couple of years and the population is like zooming up. Six billion people. Eight billion people in the information age starts. We're looking at a lot of people here, right? So how many people are too many people? It's, it's a perfectly honest question to ask. What are you going to see in your lifetime? How many people will there be on the planet? In your lifetime, it is very, very likely, highly likely, we're going to see 10 billion people. That's a lot of people. I've got some good friends from India, and they told me about these trains that everybody holds on to like this. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. I don't think it's safe at all, right? But that is a lot of people on that train, right? So different parts of the world have different population densities that living someplace like America, even in our larger cities, we don't even begin to comprehend. Oh, there we go. So if we're going to see 10 billion people in our lifetime, uh, you know, what does that mean to ecology, to, to the earth, to, to our lives? Well, let's take a look at human population growth here. So uh, one of the questions we could ask is, what is the carrying capacity of our planet? How many people can we fit on it and feed and give resources to? Let's look at human population from that graph kind of spread out really. Starting here from the first modern humans, okay, moving forward in time, there's a couple of little things that happen here. They're hard to see. Let's kind of point them out. This little bump right here is where agriculture starts. Tremendous for the human species, right? Now for the first time, like, you don't have to go hunt to get your food. You just grow it in a field. That's a pretty big deal, right? On top of that, over here, this bump is plowing and irrigation. We learn how to really farm. We start doing some animal husbandry, right? We start really, like, we can support a whole bunch more people now, and things start to rise. Do you see how this almost looks quite linear, doesn't it? Looks pretty darn linear. Over here, there's a little depression, a little bump. See that little bump right there where it goes down? That little bump is the bubonic plague, the Black Death in Europe, right? So during that time, 25 million people died. That is a lot of people that died right there. Now, if we extrapolate this out and push this out, it will be interesting to see when this is all said and done on this graph, like where COVID leads up, leaves us. It's another disease similar in respect to this, but consider what we know now compared to what they knew when the bubonic plague happened. When the bubonic plague happened, people just thought it was an act of God. They didn't know like why it was happening or how they could prevent it. They had no idea. They were designing those really weird masks that had like big pointy things that looked all scary and stuff. They really didn't know what was going on, right? Um, but uh, sanitation goes an awful long ways. Like understanding how disease and germ theory works, uh, we can now fight this stuff. Then something happens right here, just after the bubonic plague almost, and then this occurs. Holy moly. What do you think is the event that leads to this sudden increase in population? It's like a wall. That was the Industrial Revolution. That moment where we figured out, hey, machines can do all the work, and we can just kind of hang out and reap the benefits. We can burn the Earth's resources, and we can survive. Uh, world population just exploded. Look at this now, right? I mean, we're looking at an awful, awful lot of people. So world population, as of just the other day, okay, is nearing 8 billion people. We're getting, we're getting up there. We're nearing 8 billion people, so we're like right here on this graph right now. Anybody want to guess what kind of a population curve this is? 
What would you call that right there? That's like, is there a word for more than exponential? I don't know, but that is like a wall, right? It's just, it is a seriously exponential growth curve. It is almost vertical looking at that, right? So, I mean, that is pretty, pretty serious. So the question that arises, and I mentioned at the beginning, is how many people is too many people? Like, like there has to be a limit somewhere. Like you can't honestly stand side by side by side by side, like the earth is only so big, we're gonna stand in the water, right? Humans have a very different scenario than a lot of other organisms do. We have modern medicine. We have food supply that we can keep making more and more and more of, right? We can clean up our water. We could clean our air if we wanted to. We could do a lot of things that animals, other animals can't do. So what is the natural limit? And a lot of scientists have weighed in on this. And, and to be honest with you, um, economists, no, nobody knows for sure. Um, I've heard, heard estimates everywhere from like 3 billion, which is crazy low, all the way up to saying about maybe about 9 to 10 billion people is the total carrying capacity of the planet. If that's the case, in your lifetime, we'll hit the carrying capacity. What happens when you overshoot carrying capacity? Remember from the, the deer? Yeah, massive, not just a little population decrease, but massive population decrease. Why does it decrease? It can be disease, any of these population dependent things. It can be disease, it can be food supply, it could be clean water, it could be clean air, it could be anything, right? All of those factors have a huge thing to play. Let me ask you this though, just to dive into a little bit more social studies area, what happens when a country runs out of resources and countries nearby it have lots of resources, what happens in the world? War, right? And I'm not gonna make great predictions here, but the United States is sitting pretty. Because of the last glacial advance, we have tremendous fields where we can grow everything. We have so much land and area to grow food. We have amazing water resources. We have amazing mineral resources. We have, we have amazing forest resources. We have resources, the likes of which the rest of the world does not have. And we use more resources than virtually anybody else in the world. So if resources were to dwindle on our planet, and I was in a country other than here, I would be looking at the United States being like, hey guys, why don't you help us out a little bit, right? Or, you know, some of these other countries are gonna be eyeing us for this stuff. So it's interesting to think this all through, like what happens when we get to such a huge population. But I don't want you to leave you with no hope at all, because take a look at the top of this graph. And this is a projection, right? Looking up here, do you notice how it's just kind of starting to curve a little bit back, starting to turn a little? So there's things that have been happening uh, on the earth that people who study demographics and study sociology have been looking at. And one of those things is called demographic transition. Now this is a difficult graph to understand. It's actually a really simple concept. So what it is, what demographic transition is in a nutshell, is a change from high birth and death rates to low birth and death rates. So check this out. As countries become more industrialized, as they grow up and become more modernized, they tend to transition from having lots of, lots of births and lots of deaths to having very lower births and lower deaths. And here's how it plays out. If you look at the lines on this graph, if you start out over here with the gray line, it's a very high death rate, okay? People in developing countries um, tend to not live as long, okay? Uh, also, correspondingly, lots and lots of babies are born, okay? Just in those pictures I showed you before, think back to that. Uh, then, uh, as we go, as population goes over time here, okay, birth rates tend to kind of stay the same for a little bit, but death rates drop dramatically as things industrialize, as we get better water supply, better uh, health care, better, um, better air quality, better resources, better food, better nutrition, right? All those things contribute to lower death rates. So death rates start to drop, but people continue as they always have for a long, long time, 
having lots and lots of babies. Why? Because that's how you do it, right? I just talked to a buddy of mine the other day, um, and he came from a family that lived out in the country, around here. He had 10 siblings. Wow, there's nothing wrong with that, but wow, that's a lot of kids, right? Um, and he said, yeah, my dad, it wasn't like a religious thing or anything like that. My dad was just, my dad and my mom were just like kind of old fashioned and like that's how their parents did it and how their parents did it and their parents did it. It was like perfectly fits with the story right here is that you've got this very high birth rate, like having lots of kids. He grew up on a farm because your kids would work the farm. They took care of you in your old age. Like they did all those things. Think about the new information age. People go off and get jobs, right? Do do women always stay at home and, and work or, 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 and, and take care of the children, or do they sometimes go get jobs? They go get jobs sometimes, right? So it's it's very different world now than it was back then, and uh, things have changed quite a bit. So anyway, birth rates tend to start to drop as more and more females enter the workplace or maybe don't have as many kids, um, and things start to change. And then the population growth kind of levels off. And we're seeing that around the world in places that have transitioned. So that's demographic transition. Um, it's kind of an exciting thing. Let's look at it in terms of the different countries we talked about. So here's Nigeria. The US has slow growth. The Germany uh, has kind of a decline in growth. So think about, I, I picked these countries out because I hope you might know something about them. Think about life in, say, Nigeria. What do you think healthcare is like there? Or water, or food? Or like if you're, if, you're, if you're living off the land and farming, you need a lot of kids to do that. You need a lot of people to work the fields and to take care of you because th there's not any social security after you, there's no retirement, right? Your children have to take care of you for you to survive um, when you can't till the field anymore. It's very different. Let me ask you a little bit about that compared to the United States. Think about what we have here, or say Germany, if you know anything about Germany or, or Europe, okay? So it's a very, very different scenario, isn't it? There's one last piece to this puzzle, which is, is pretty interesting, that most folks don't really recognize. A lot of this has to do with basic human rights, and in particular, the rights of women. Okay? In some countries, you're not allowed to work if you're a woman. You are expected to have a certain amount of children, and that is basically your role in society. And there's nothing wrong with deciding to do that, but you don't have a choice. Like, that is, that is what you are told to do. You may not even get to choose who you, who you marry or who you're with, right? You just are expected to do these things. And so when what we see throughout the world is that in places where there are more rights for women, there is a corresponding change in population. And it's, and it's, it's a huge difference, right? So it, it, that is one big benefit for more rights for everybody, right? Is it's, it's better for the world as well. So anyway, uh, this is age structure in the population. I think you guys were able to answer all your questions now. So uh, any questions at all? No?